Do you want to make it easier for patients to find your office? Instantly increase your credibility and your likability to your new patients. Do you need a website for your healthcare clinic but don't know how to get started? Or maybe you have an old website that you know that needs to be refreshed. Well, you're in the right place. Today, our interview with Kyle Oranger with six steps to select a website designer for a small health professional website in 2018. My name is Jean Eaton, your practice management mentor with Information Managers and your host for this Practice Management Nuggets webinar. In this 30-minute webinar, Kyle Orange will help you to understand how to select a website designer for your healthcare practice. Over the last 20 years, Kyle Orange has worked with hundreds of clients to deliver impactful, effective communications and marketing solutions. From logos to advertising, publications to websites, he has delighted his clients with the clarity that he brings to every project. Kyle, this is a great way to start off 2018. I'm so delighted that you've joined us today. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Nice to be here. Kyle, you've been in the marketing and business for uh, some time. We've worked together on websites, designs. So tell me a little bit more about how you got into doing website designs. Well, I've been a graphic designer here for over 20 years, and originally we started doing logos and print work, and over time I saw the writing on the wall, the world is going digital, I need to get into website design. Um, So 15 years ago we started doing uh, just web design for website, and then over time we've been pulling that more and more in-house. So today we design and build websites all in-house here with our small team, and we do it for small businesses, medium-sized businesses, uh, associations, um, and we help meet their business goals and needs and make sure that we're a good partner for them for the, when they need to make updates and changes, and they can rely on us to help keep their websites all up and running. Okay. You're right. We are certainly in a digital age, and even if we're not selling widgets, um, we've got a service or providing uh, a presence in our community, we still need to cross over to the dark side and make sure that we have a digital presence even when we're talking face-to-face with our patients and our clients in our local businesses. It's true. Um, at one time, you could just put an ad in the Yellow Pages, and that was all. That was your entire marketing strategy and budget for the year. But now that really isn't an option, and now you really need a website to be your, uh, the public face of your practice. Um, and anything, any marketing that you do is going to be directing people to the websites, whether it's your social media, whether it's print advertising, any you know, marketing promo items you do will all have your website on it. So your website really is the, you know, one of the first points of contact that, they'll, um, that a patient will have with your, with your business. That's a great point, and we want to be able to make sure that our, our patients can find us, and not only just our patients, but other healthcare professionals. So if you're working in a practice and you need to refer to somebody else, the first place that your staff are going to go is on the website. So you need to make sure that the patients can find you, but so can all of those referring partners. One of the great things about having a website is how is having it so you can position and distinguish yourself versus other people in the same industry. So if you are a, uh, if you're a dentist and you have, you do a certain kind of work as a dentist, you can advertise that on your website and, um, uh, it helps distinguish you from other dentists who do different kinds of specializations. So when someone is looking for, I'm looking for a pediatric dentist in this such and such area, then you have a greater chance of coming up for those sort of sort of searches. You're not just general dentist who does whatever. You are a de- you're being found as a dentist who is in a specific area and does a specific kind of practice. Right. So. Most of us working in healthcare are really good about what we do in healthcare, but we've never designed a website before, and we really don't know where to get started. This is certainly the pink elephant in the room. Um, Now, every practice has a pink elephant. It's that problem in your organization that just never quite gets fixed, or you've created workarounds, or you promise that you'll get to it someday. Or if you're a new practice that's just getting started, you know it's something that you need to do, but you really just don't know how to get started with it. Kyle, please tell us. What do healthcare providers and clinic managers need to know about selecting a website design for your healthcare practice? What is your number one tip? My number one tip for selecting a website designer to help you build your website is to make sure you meet with them before you ask for a proposal. 
And the reason why I said that, we're going to get into that with our six steps. I'm going to explain why that is and how you can find a website supplier that's going to match what you need for the budget you have and get a good result that's really going to help your business grow. So, Kyle, I'm, I'm really surprised about your number one tip. We're not talking about technology. We're talking about a relationship. We are, yeah. I think it's more, it's so important to start that relationship right because that's going to be a, a partner you're going to work with for a really long time or you could work for a really long time. And that relationship really trumps budget, really trumps a lot of other things. Because when you work with someone really well, you're so much more open with them. They're so much more open with you. They can be a lot more flexible with you. And they, they're also, you have a really good feeling that they're listening to you. So that means you're going to get to a result and a solution faster than working with someone who may be cheaper, but maybe they're not listening, maybe they're not as good, maybe it's kind of frustrating. But when you have that really great relationship with your supplier, then you are, things get done so much faster, they know you better, trust them more, and you can really focus on getting, meeting your goals and do it in a way that's a really enjoyable process. So it's, it's so important to do that because in this kind of business, so many things can go wrong, so many frustrations can happen. And if you can find a relationship that minimizes that, then you are so ahead of the game. That's a really important part. There are many things that we can do in our life, in our businesses that is online. And it doesn't require a relationship. If you need a widget, you can go online and get the best price for, for that widget. But you've made a really important point that we're building a relationship not just to do the website today. It, that is, becomes the foundation of the way that you're going to continue to market your practice for as long as you're in practice. So buying locally, developing that relationship locally, and, and developing a process that works for you that reflects your best practices makes a lot of sense to me. It makes a ton of sense. Um, it's, your website is a critical piece of business infrastructure, and you want to make sure that it's working, it's on, it's smooth, it's updated, um, and it's not something you want to necessarily you know, dive into yourself um, and spend a lot of hours figuring out how to do it yourself. Getting an expert to help you with it, um, you get good advice, you get the latest technology, you get um, um, experience of that provider doing this all the time. Um, I'm always a, uh, a proponent of when you have to hire someone to help you, hire someone who does that, who does that thing all the time because they know the pitfalls, they know the, the fast solutions, they know where the good value is, and they can deliver that to you. Kyle, let's get started. You've got six tips about selecting a website designer. What's the first thing that we need to do? Well, let's define what we're talking about. Websites are so broad. There can be a massive website. There can be a small website. There can be something that has all kinds of bells and whistles on it and something that has so just the bare minimum. And so um, what, what is it that we're building? What is it that really makes sense? Um, so let's define who we're talking about here first. Um, you're likely a health, uh, health practitioner in an office of maybe one to ten people. Um, you may be starting up or you might be in business for a while. Um, you might not have any web presence at all uh, or your web presence is outdated and was maybe built more than four years ago. Um, your old website um, may not have been built to be responsive, which means it looks good on tablets and phones. Um, and maybe your old website needs to update its styles and uh, maybe look more modern. Um, and sometimes um, practi uh, health practitioners say, well, you know, my website's up and it's looking fine. Um, but really to the younger people, maybe the younger potential patients, they, you want those people to look at you and say, yeah, this, this is an awesome place and I want to you know, explore further and make, make, make that call. For those younger people, they notice right away if your site is, uh, is outdated because they look at these things all the time. They might look at your site and say, oh, this is totally outdated. I don't want to work with this person. Um, so they make that snap judgment really quickly. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to keep your site updated and, and working. So that's what we're talking about here is you're looking for a new website or updating an old one. So next, um, what do you need your website to do for you? Again, we've said your, your website is the public face of your practice, and any marketing you do will direct people to it. Your website should look as professional as you are, and you can look at it as uh, maintaining your professional brand and image. Um, but the main thing here is this is a business thing. You want more patients coming to you. Your website should really generate new patient referrals. So how does a website do that? 
let's look for a second at how someone might find your practice and how they make a decision to choose you. A patient might do a Google search or maybe ask their friends who will send them to you. Go to their website, go take a look, see who they are. This is my favorite dentist, chiropractor, GP. Um, so they start learning about you through your website. They open up the home page and start evaluating your practice if, if your practice is a good fit for them. This might take a few seconds, but they do these things in their head. It happens very quickly, um, and I've got a few points of what they do when they, when they get to a site. One, does this practitioner look like they deal with my issue? Do they look like they're going to deal with my neck pain, my back pain, my dental care? Have I arrived at someone who can help me with my medical issue? If it's not obvious, right away on the site, then they're probably going to leave right away. So making sure your site really gets across what services you offer and, um, and what you do right away. Two, do they do this service I, it looks like they do this service I need, but is this something that they are really good at and do all the time? So you might have a big bulleted list of here's all the services that we do, and the service I'm looking for is bullet number 10 buried on page five. Well, maybe this isn't something they do all the time. Maybe this is not their specialty. I don't know if this is the right person for me. But if it is, um, then three, will I be comfortable going to this practice? Um, this is where all the stuff about reassuring the patient comes in. Things like, will I trust this person who is treating me? Will I feel safe? Does this location look professional? Does it look like it's in a good part of town? You know, what kind of building is it in? Does their service style suit my taste? Um, is my taste very formal and professional? Or do I want somebody super friendly? Or do I want someone who's like budget? I really need a really, someone who can really give me a good deal on this because I don't have a lot of money and that's what I need. Does that match what I'm looking for? Next, do they treat people like me? You know, if I'm going to a certain kind of practice, all the pictures are of seniors. Well, maybe that's not maybe who I'm going to feel comfortable with. I've got an eight-year-old kid I want to get treated. Maybe this isn't the right place. Oppositely, oh, this is someone who has a lot of family and kids on their site. Maybe that's really not who I am because I'm 65 years old and I want to, you know, have someone who I can more relate to. Um, and, of course, where are they and are they convenient to get to? Kyle, on, on the other side of that, if I'm a, a healthcare provider and this is a great opportunity to make sure that the website reflects what I want to do more of. So if I'm a healthcare provider that specializes in, in pediatric services, I want to have most of my clients being pediatrics, then most of my pictures should be of kids and families. If I'm, and, and exactly they're right. going to attract the clients and the patients that you want for your practice. Sometimes my, my clients get nervous about um, promoting their specialization. They say, well, I do all these, these services and I don't want to lose all this other business by saying I do this one thing. And I reply back to them. I say, well, marketing is about um, fishing for your best type of client, the kind of client and the, or the kind of patient that you want to work with and the kind of services that you want to offer. You can still say yes to all these other things that you do, but your marketing dollars and your marketing effort all goes into finding that next best, best patient. Right. So highlighting that on your website, that becomes a way of featuring, hey, this is what I really want to do more of, and I think it's okay to, to, to trumpet that. I, I couldn't agree more. So please tell us the next step. All right. So that's, here's what we're, what we're building here. So we've defined kind of what the overall effect is, what we're trying to do. So let's get into six steps. So step one, let's determine a budget. How much money is the right amount to spend on a website? If you just ask around, you can get quotes from like tens of thousands of dollars to like hundreds of dollars. It seems like it's all over the map. Where do you start? Well, um, if you, and here, here's the problem going, going into setting a budget. If you underspend, you get a cookie cutter site. It'll look plain and chances are they're based on an older template and look dated right out of the box. And if you do a super cheap site, there'll be nobody around to support you. If someone goes wrong, uh, no one will be around to help fix it quickly. On the other side, if you overspend, you'll get an amazing site, but really for a small office, that really isn't an option. Um, you're not going to start spending all this money on something you can't afford. That doesn't make sense. So how much is appropriate to spend on a small website? Here are some uh, ballparks to give you a sense. For our studio, $2,000 would be the bare minimum to get a site up and running with a few pages. $3,500 would get you a nicer looking site with more content, and $6,000 would get you a site with more content about your specializations, more galleries, 
more features and articles about your specializations. $10,000 we get you a site with more features and more custom design pages. Um, so it gives you sort of a quick broad ballpark of what, we're, what we could be looking at. Um, in a business context, uh, if you look at what you spend over a year, um, you know, if you spend maybe 1% or 2% of your annual revenue on marketing, that's not unrealistic. Would you agree, Jean? I, I think that's a, a very reasonable budget price, 1% to 2% of your annual revenue. So if you have a small practice that's doing 300000 a year, 1% of that is $3,000. Um, if you spread that over two years or two and a half years, that becomes $6,000. That's a pretty affordable equation, and that can get you a site, a very nice-looking site, very professional, very current, and very custom to you and your branding, which is, I think, an important thing as well. So there's a, a ballpark and, and a budget for where it comes from and how to, how to get to that number. So, Kyle, I want to jump in here for just a second. Sure. Um, one of the things to remember when you're, when you're costing out the, the website is all of those pieces that go into the website that you're going to use for other purposes. So you're going to um, get some artwork, get some, some logo, and get some help to make some decisions about what your image is going to be so that you're going to um, recreate that on, on your business cards and your letterhead and your signage and, and all of that sort of thing. So it's just not just having a website. It's that whole package deal, isn't it? I'm nodding as, as you're talking, yes. Um, in a perfect world, uh, if someone is starting a new practice, we would say let's do a logo first and then let's do an overall look for your business, so how that logo gets applied to all your materials. And once that is done, let's start a website after that because then you've got this look already established that you can apply to a website. In a perfect world, that's a great way to go um, and one that we definitely recommend. Um, if someone comes to us with saying, well, we already have a logo, we already have a bit of a look, and let's, now we need a website, we can say, fine, we can certainly work with that as well and carry on that branding through, um, through your website. That's okay as well. It's one thing you don't want to be caught doing is inventing a new look for every new piece that you do, whether, oh, we're going to develop a new look for the website, and, but it doesn't really look like the postcard that we just sent out, and it doesn't look like our billboard. Now you've got this mishmash of of advertising, and that becomes very confusing to anybody trying to find you. So you're totally right, Jean. Getting a consistent look first is definitely the way to go. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's step one, determining a budget. Step two, um, let's find the right category of website builders who can build your in your budget and who are a fit for your size of project. So the people who can build a website for you break into – break down to about three broad categories. A, independent freelance web, de web design and marketing people. So they're independent people working by themselves. B, small design or marketing firms, maybe up to 10 people, uh, but most of them will have more, more three to five people. C, larger web or ad agencies of 10 plus people. So which category is right for you? Well, let's take a look at the skills that you need to build the small website maybe of 10 pages that has a custom design. What skills do we really need for that? You need some writing skills. You need some design skills. You need some development skills. So let's compare that back to our categories. So let's look at our independent freelance web design people. Um, it's rare to find writing and design and development all in one person. Um, that's pretty rare to find in, in one person. Um, with your independent freelance people, make sure they're committed to freelancing. Have they been doing this for a long time? If they're doing this for 10 years, great, they're still going to do it. If they've just graduated out of school and they're trying, you know, you're just trying out and they want to use your project as a, as a, as a starter project, um, it'll be inexpensive for sure, but I'm not sure if they're going to be still there in a couple of years. They're probably going to move on to something else. When you want to find them again, that can be a bit of a problem. So. Their availability in the future can be an issue with the independent freelance people. Um, B, the small designer marketing firms. Um, with having more people on the team, there are more skills and more capacity to get projects done faster than the freelancer. Um, the small firm is more likely to be around uh, because they probably have, they might have a small office, they have more infrastructure, they're not going to disappear um, quickly. Um, and for the small designer marketing firm, they appreciate your set, your, your project. They appreciate your, your project because that's about the right project that they do all the time. Um, and again, I've said before that uh, love working with people who do your project all the time and bring all those skills and experience to it. 
Um, a small team will, again, brings more skills. They'll have more writing, more design, and more development experience on board, so that's, that's a good thing too. See uh, the larger web or ad agency, the 10 people. Um, for them, um, you know, the, they put a bunch of people onto a project. Um, and of course, the more people that you put on a project, the more money you're paying. Uh, if you're building a big site for a large municipality, that makes complete sense, and it's a great way to go. But larger firms don't get up in the morning for less than $30,000, so that's really not going to be an option for the five-person practice. Um, so we've got some categories here. Um, summing up, the, the independent freelance person can probably do this for you, but they may not be around. The small designer marketing firm can totally do this for you, and um, they'll have more, bring more skills to, uh, to the project, which is a good thing, and they'll probably be around longer. Um, the larger web or ad agencies probably won't even touch it. They probably won't even look at your project, so not really an option. So moving on to step three, so then starting your research. Let's go find somebody. Let's see, see who's out there, who's doing this. Now that you have a sense of what you want built and a budget, you can now start searching for a firm that's going to want to build it for you. And because you're well prepared and they've done some planning out, when you start talking to people on the phone with you, um, they're going to take you more seriously and they're going to want to work with you more. So now that you've thought about, I want this size site and I want um, you know, match some existing branding, when you're speaking to someone on the phone, you're, have a, you're, you're coming to the table with a bit more of a clear vision of what you want and a clearer budget, and then someone on the other side of the phone, that first phone call will say, this sounds like a serious client. I'm going to take them seriously. I'm going to, I'm going to chat with you, give you advice, and, and, start, and uh, continue the conversation, um, which is far better than coming into a conversation with, well, I'm thinking about something, you know, a hazy vision of a project. The person on the other end doesn't know how to help you. So... Um, coming into it being more specific is super helpful as, from a supplier perspective. As you, um, as you do some research, um, you can start evaluating these companies' websites as you start looking at them. Um, you'll be likely looking for a smaller web or marketing company with a few employees. Um, maybe you, you'll also be looking for, do they have any experience working with health practitioners or in healthcare? It's always nice having someone across the table who knows a little bit about your industry so you don't have to explain every little thing to them. Um, if they come at it knowing a little bit about healthcare and about running a small business, that, that, that's super useful, and you'll be able to relate to them more, which is, which is great. Um, do they have a client list that is other companies of similar size to yours? Again, just seeing what kind of experience that they have. Um, and, of course, there's also um, some aesthetic things to judge as well. Do you, uh, when you look at their portfolio of web work, um, do you like the work that they do for others? Or do you like these sites? It's as simple as that. Um, do you like the tone and style of their own website? Do you like the way their website speaks to you and how you click through it and delivers a good experience? Um, do they have any uh, evidence of satisfied clients? Do they have a couple of testimonials on their site? Do they have anything that says people are really happy with, uh, with who they are? Maybe it's a BVB rating. Maybe it's a uh, happy testimonial. Maybe it's case studies of work, do they have anything on there um, that fits, fits with you? Uh, when you have a short list of companies, call them and get a sense of what are they like to work with and how much they know about your area of practice. Do you like speaking with them? In the first call, get a sense of what kind of budget range they are recommending to you. Um, it's always nice to get some kind of ballpark in that first phone call uh, with the supplier. They should be give, able to give you something. Nobody wants to give you firm numbers over a phone, but they should be able to say, okay, we're talking, you know, I've got a budget of $5,000, are we still talking? Um, and just get that out of the way early on. Um, or if they say, well, yeah, we're thinking $25,000, are we still talking? And you say, well, maybe not. So get that out of the way early on so that you can move on and find someone who's going to be right for you. So it's really important to be able to, to do some homework before you uh, contact some web designers. You need to spend some time, you yourself personally, um, as, as that healthcare provider or that clinic manager, to get a sense about what type of image you want to portray to the public and your future employees and your referral partners about what you want to do in a practice and then try and work from that so that your website and your marketing reflect what it is that your business is about. Correct. Um, one of the first steps that we usually do with our web clients is we look at 
let's look at a bunch of other websites in your industry. So if you are a dentist, let's look at a bunch of other dental uh, websites and then show them to you and let's have a discussion about what you like and what you don't like. Um, just early on, just getting a sense right away of uh, what's like. We find, um, you know, if you ask somebody, you know, oh, what colors do you like? Oh, well, I like this color and that color. Okay, but if I put something in front of you, we get a reaction right away. Oh, I hate this. I love that. Great. That's fantastic. This helps narrow down uh, our design choices, and we get a, a much clearer sense from you right away what, what it is that you like and don't like. So it's a nice step to take in the, in the process. Okay, thank you. All right, so now that you have narrowed down uh, the suppliers you may want to talk to, um, meet with them if you can. Um, you, narrowing this down to maybe two or three would be a good thing, good thing to do. Um, meeting with them is so important uh, because with sourcing creative services, I find building the relationship is the most important factor. When people trust a supplier, the price becomes much less relevant because they're getting the services they need that solves their issue. When, when a client is really happy, they're happy to pay for it. And, when, and they'll, they'll pay, they'll pay a, a decent amount of money to get great service. And when they get not so great service or it's a frustrating process, they want to penny pinch everything all along the way because they're just unhappy with the value they're getting. Um, so a good relationship means you're going to get better value. That's what that means. Um, a good relationship with a creative supplier means you are comfortable with their process, you're comfortable with speaking to them, and ultimately, you're going to be very comfortable with what they're going to create for you to represent you to your patients. Um, it's a very funny thing to hire somebody else to make an image to represent you to somebody else. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very personal um, thing to do. Um, and you can, you can see how much trust you have to have in this other person who's going to make such a big difference for you in, in your business. Because um, there's so many personal preferences that can come into play. And that person has to get to know you um, figure out what personal preferences are really the important ones and reflect that back in the work that they're, that they're giving you. Um, so it's, it, that relationship is so, so important. Um, so the, uh, the initial design and build of the site will take maybe six to eight weeks, depending on how the process goes. Um, and this, these people are going to be your go-to people for updates, for content, and for software. So you're going to want to choose someone that you like and will be happy to work with for, for years. Um, so that's step four, meeting with them. Um, and then even, you know, very quickly of meeting with them or even having a, a, a deep chat with them on, on the phone, you'll get a very good sense of, like, how much they want to work with you, how much they know. Um, and this is more of a, an investment of time, but it's, it's a really important investment of time to get the supplier that you, that you want, and it's, and it's worth it. Um, it can make the process go so much better. Um, step five, uh, get estimates and proposals. Um, once you've met with them, you probably have a pretty good sense of, of yes, we've got the, the right kinds of people to work with, and now let's get this down on paper. Let's see what they're really going to do for us and what the, what the real dollar amount is going to be. Um, so if you're, if you're stuck between a couple of them, getting a proposal from each will help compare the two more objectively. Um, now, I want to emphasize here, it's only now, after you've done your research, after you've met with them, now get the proposal from them. Um, you know, if you, if you decided at the very beginning to send out a shotgun of pick 20 firms and send out, you know, 20 requests for proposal without really defining what you need, it might have been a waste of time for everybody. Um, desperate firms would guess at what you wanted and, and underquoted. Large firms would quote a huge package of services you can't afford. And the qualified firms that maybe were the exact right fit for you might have just completely ignored you because you didn't sound like you were serious, didn't sound like you were organized, and it may not have been worth their time to reply to this RFP going to everybody in the world. Um, so it, but at this point, now that you have this so narrowed down, the proposals you're going to get back are going to be very tailored to you, very meaningful for you, and, and fit your needs and requirements very, very tightly at this point. Now that's a good use of time for everybody involved, for the supplier and the practitioner. Um, and you can get really worthwhile proposals that actually fit what you, what you need. Um, so looking at these proposals, you know, you want to evaluate, uh, obviously what they're going to do for you, how, what their process is. Um, you know, you can look at their portfolio and experience on the team and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, some other things to look at in these proposals are, um, can, 
and even in meeting with them, are they explaining themselves well? Are they explaining website terms and processes and their software and their technology in ways that you're comfortable with and you understand? Um, there are, this conversation isn't about technology, but you do want to make sure the person across the table from you is explaining things in, in a way that you are comfortable with and you understand, and they're answering all your questions that you may be having as you, as you go forward. Um, you know, as a health practitioner, you don't deal with web servers and web technologies and domain names all the time. They do, and are they explaining things well enough to you that you feel comfortable with and you feel like you have control over the situation? Um, that's what they should be doing there. Um, another thing that uh, may come up in a proposal is what their payment options are. Um, oftentimes, freelance designers need to be paid. Sort of the project is all built like a construction site. It's all paid up front. Um, but others may have payment options. They may be able to take your um, the lump sum payment and spread it out over maybe a year or two uh, or turn it into a monthly subscription or something like that. That might help um, from the business side, helping to afford a larger website and get you the site that you really need rather than only spending you know, what you can afford this month, um, which may not get you everything that you need. Um, so getting, working with someone who may have some payment options might help you uh, spread that out if that's something you need. All right. Any thoughts about that, Jean? No, I think those are great points. You've brought some points, Kyle, that somebody may not have thought about. The relationship is a really big thing. This really is that you know, part of your crown jewels for your business. So I strongly believe that you want to make sure that the, the vendors that you're working with that are going to manage your crown jewels are somebody that you should be able to, to see and go to their their, their place of business and, and make sure that they're a reputable, reputable organization. So having uh, a local somebody to help you with that, I think, is a really key piece. I think it's really important to remember that this is something that you're going to um, help build your, your business for the next two or three years. Now, technology changes, and you can refresh your image. Um, if you find that you've got an image or a brand or a color or font style, that you thought was really great and you find out later it wasn't the right choice, that's easy enough to change. But you need somebody to help you make those decisions. It's, it's a lot of decisions to get started with. And um, having somebody who's experienced, who's got lots of practice, and can see that long-term picture for you is really important to be able to build that, that relationship with. Um, so you're, you're and, working and like with... You I was just going to say that it's, it's so nice to be able to, to meet with someone in their office and have them walk through a website. So there's so many moving parts and pieces on it. Um, chatting about, it's harder to do over the phone. Um, it's so nice to be able to sort of sit in front, in front of a machine with somebody and, and go through that and point at elements and say, well, can we fix this? Or this is what this is going to do. And it, it speeds up the process and makes it more more enjoyable. And you understand it better. Yes. And then you have confidence moving forward, like, oh, what did they build for me? Oh, right, we talked about this in the meeting. This is what it was going to do. Fantastic. Um, right. There are so many options of how a page can be built and what can happen on it that um, it's good to, to sit down and walk through it with them. Um, we'll walk through it together as they discuss, well, it can do this, it can do that, it can be shaped this way, this can happen when the mouse rolls over such and such, this link will take you there, um, showing all that live and in person is a, is a great way to really understand what's happening with your site. And there are so many bells and whistles and technology and plugins and, and all that sort of thing to choose from. To make a decision on your own without somebody, an expert to help you with that is, is really challenging. Now, we're not talking a lot about technology in this interview, um, but one thing I want to make sure that many healthcare providers look at the functionality about engaging the patients with their, their website. And that's an important purpose for a website. But one of the things I want to caution people with is the online booking. Um, many websites offer an online booking for the patients. And patients want it. Patients are more engaged in digital health than ever before from all age groups. There are a number of studies and that have been done that show that 98% of patients would prefer to be able to interact um, with the office of their healthcare provider um, than using digital tools like website and online booking rather than making um, a phone call to the clinic. So we need to be able to offer that option. So if you're looking at online booking, make sure that you are using a secure 
um, application to be able to do that. Most electronic medical record systems now have an integrated online booking. So it looks like it's on your website, but it actually stores all of the data on your secure electronic medical record. And if you don't have an EMR system in place, there are other third-party uh, online booking tools that will manage that information securely for you. So that's web different than being on your website database. So I have lots of other articles, and we'll put some in the learning resources guide about how to engage patients with online booking and emails and some cautions. But that's one of the functionality that you want to talk about with your website designer, about what do you want your website to do. You want the patients to know who you are, where you are, what do you, what do, you do, and how can they engage with you. And this is a great opportunity for you to be able to share articles with your patients and let them know when you come to our practice, this, these are the things that you need to bring with you. If you regularly do some type of in-house procedures, what should they be prepared for? Um, do they need a driver? Should they bring their sunglasses with them? All of that sort of thing can be done on your website, which will relieve a stopgap in your office about your staff answering the phone and having the time to be able to tell the patient all the things that they need to bring with them to be prepared for their appointment with you. Yeah, those are excellent points. I want to add one other point on top of that. When it comes time to say how you want to promote yourself and what you want to offer, you have to be very careful in the health sphere about how you say that. You should really check with your regulatory body. Um, they will have guidelines for you on what you can and cannot say in your site. If you're, say, you're offering, you want to offer a special deal or a package of services, your regulatory body may say, whoops, no, you actually can't do that because it's against, uh, against our guidelines. Um, so do check with your regulatory body first before you start offering some of these deals so that you don't run afoul of that. You don't need that. Um, but it's a, it's a really good tip for health practitioners to, to check out before you get too far and too carried away marketing yourself on, on your website. Right. And uh, we certainly have seen lots of examples of people that have gone and, and done things independently and get slapped on the wrist and getting told that they can't do it. So find out what the rules are before you do it. Exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's, um, that is how you find your website designer. Um, once you start working with them, step six, once you select your web firm and you start working on them, um, I want to say that you, want, you should expect steady progress on your projects. Um, there should be weekly updates or weekly meetings, and your site should be done in maybe four to six weeks if everything's going well, maybe a little longer if you need some longer time for approvals. Um, but that's a realistic timeline, and you should sort of see steady progress. Um, sometimes you hear stories about, oh, yeah, my website's designed, I've been working on it, and it's been six months, and they're still working on it. Like, well, that's, that's awfully long. What's, what's going on there? So make sure that you are, they are working on it and things are moving and progressing forward. So uh, just a little expectation of what you, can, what you can have when you start working with a, with a web company. Okay. Um, having a, a bit of a timeline to understand how long this is going to take for you, um, when you first get started with your practice, you've got many things that you're, you're spending time on and you're being concerned about. So knowing how long of a time it's going to take to get your website in place is a great way to help you with your project management. And we've already talked about the budget piece, which is super useful. What are some other tips, Kyle, about what should you expect to receive from that website design process? Um, talking about your website URL, does your website designer actually purchase that for you, or should you be doing that yourself? Good question. Uh, we like our clients to have control over their own URL. So if you is so if it's geneeden.ca is your is your website address. Um, we like for you to have control of that. That domain URL controls all the traffic that goes to your website, goes to your email, and any other properties associated with that URL. It's nice if you have control over that, um, just in case, you know what, I want to move the website or I want to change the email provider. Um, you always, by having that URL, you have the codes for that and you have complete control over that. If it lies with someone else, with web person who we hired five years ago and they have the account and we don't know where they are anymore, whoops, now you don't have control over that URL anymore and now you're stuck. Now you have to you go through a whole bunch of different process to get, get that control back. So if you, if you keep it, make sure it's under your name and you're paying that domain registration every year just for that domain, then that's fantastic. Um, and just to be clear, your, your web domain, your website hosting, your email hosting are all three separate things. 
Sometimes they, they can be lumped together under one service, but they are actually three separate things, and they don't all have to be at the same place. So your uh, email services might be with Microsoft 365, your web hosting might be with your web people, and your domain may be hosted with GoDaddy or with, you know, with Sira, um, and, that's, and that's totally okay. That's, that's totally all right. Making sure you have control over that, you know where it is, it's really important. It's a critical part of your business infrastructure, and you don't want to just let somebody walk walk off with that on you. Absolutely. Um, that's part of your your crown jewels for your business. If you lose control of your website URL, you've lost your email, you've lost your uh, online di digital um, persona, and you don't want to do that. So that should be considered part of your, your crown jewels. I also have a personal preference. I believe that it's important to actually have somebody different managing your website host and, and managing your website URL. So if there is something that happens um, in this crazy world that uh, a company goes belly up or they have a big privacy breach or something else happening, you don't have all of your crown jewels in the same basket. Right, right. Good advice. Good advice. Okay. Um, the images on the website, um, Kyle, is that something that the the owner, the, the business, should actually have copies of and, and be able to use, yes? Uh, yes, if you um, oftentimes will will use stock photography for um, uh, for website images and for other uh, other branding pieces for for the business. Um, if you can make sure when those um, stock images are bought, make sure they're licensed to you rather than licensed to the firm if you can. Um, if they're licensed to your business, then you can use them in multiple pieces. Um, but if they're licensed to the, the designer, then they can use them in multiple pieces, but it doesn't really help you. If you want to have the freedom to um, have those images on and use them in your Word files and PowerPoint and whatever, make sure they're licensed to your business and not to the designer. That way the, uh, the stock company says, great, you're the, you're the license holder. You can use them on whatever you need to for the royalty-free images. It's a typical way of licensing them. Um, if they're licensed with the designer, then you don't have the right to use them everywhere else, and you might get caught up on that. I've never heard of anyone getting caught on that, but if you want to live to the letter of the, of the license agreement, make sure it's under your name. If you've got more questions for Kyle, you can enter them into the chat button or in the question and answer button, and we'll uh, reply back to you by email. Kyle, this has been super useful. You've given us some great information about how to select a website designer. You've given us some really helpful points about what to expect in that relationship, how much time it's going to take from us to be able to do it, some ballpark figures and some timelines, which are really very useful. And I want to thank you so much for that. You're very welcome. Okay. Now, you've also got a very generous offer for people that are part of our webinar um, Kyle, would you please tell us about your offer? Sure. What we want to do here at Kyle Mancha Design, we wanted to offer something to listeners of, of the podcast. Um, so what we're offering is $500 credit towards the redesign or rebuild of your next website. Um, if we estimated it at more than $3,000, we will give you this credit um, of $500 on your next project, which is that's pretty substantial for a uh, for a small website. So. That might spur you on to uh, maybe have a chat with us, and we can see if we're a good fit for you, um, and then we can we can go from there. But it might be a way, a good way of kicking off your uh, um, kicking off 2018 for you with getting a new website. If you've been thinking about it and trying to, you know, find a person to who could help you, maybe this might be something to uh, get that project moving for you this year. That is a very generous offer. So to take advantage of this offer, you go to the website, and the link is on our, our slides here, and fill out the contact form, and then Kyle or folks in his, his design office will follow up with you and give you some information about website design that will work for your practice, and you can claim that $500 credit. Kyle, this has been so useful. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. And to our audience, I want to thank you for joining us for Practice Management Nuggets. I look for guest experts just like Kyle who will share their number one tip for you to help you with your healthcare practice and the business of your practice. Until next time, this is Jean Eaton, your Practice Management Mentor with Information Managers.